In a video I posted recently about scrapping ships, I mentioned that the White Star Liner Britannic was retired in 1960. This led to a lot of comments about Britannic, with some viewers asking, didn't Britannic sink during World War I? It is true that the HMHS Britannic, an Olympic class White Star Liner, did sink during World War I after hitting a mine off the coast of Key. However, the Britannic that I was referring to in the video was the MV Britannic, launched for White Star Line in 1929 and the third ship of the White Star Line fleet to carry the name Britannic. Using the same name for multiple ships might seem a little bit confusing, but it isn't unique to White Star Line, nor is it unique to history, with Carnival Corporation recently announcing that its latest Excellence Class cruise ship, due to enter service in 2022, will be named Carnival Celebration. This is a name it takes from the 1987 built holiday class Carnival cruise ship, Celebration, which sailed with the line until 2008. I'm Chris Frame, and today we're going to be looking at how cruise lines name their ships, and why the same names are so often reused. When steamships first started plying the world's oceans in the 19th century, steamship operators were few and far between. But as these services grew in popularity, more and more competitors entered the market. At the time, passengers got their information through printed media and word of mouth. Newspapers, which were the main source of printed media, used to print sailing schedules which would list the ships that were departing the various ports and their destinations. These listings could be confusing to read and difficult for future passengers to understand. We're not talking about glossy printed brochures that have nice pictures, we're talking about literal sailing schedules that are printed in black and white and would just list the names of the ships and their destinations. So lines named their ships in ways to allow travellers to easily identify which shipping line the ship was sailing for. Different companies, like today, had different brand attributions. On the North Atlantic, Cunard, for example, was known for its safety. The Collins Line from the United States in the 19th century was known for its speed. White Star Line was known for its highly luxurious product. And so by having ships named in a certain way that would help you identify their owner, it brought with it those brand attributions to those various ships. The Great Western Steamship Company was among the earliest steamship operator and commenced this practice, including the word great in the names of both of their steamships, the Great Western and the Great Britain. When Cunard commenced services in 1840, they established a naming practice that saw their vessels' names end in IA, with most of their ships named after ancient Roman provinces. The IA ending would make it easy for travellers to identify a Cunard ship in the advertised sailing schedules. This tradition, save for a few exceptions, lasted until the 1960s. Similarly, the White Star Line started naming their ships with words that ended in IC, with most of their ships' names having ancient Greek origins. In the Netherlands, Holland America Line ships had been given names that end in Dam since the 1880s, with Dam in Dutch meaning the same as it does in English, a barricade that creates a water reservoir. So from the earliest days of passenger ships, a ship's name has been used to help identify the shipping line. This is true today, with many cruise lines having a shared naming convention for their fleet, to aid in brand recognition. Costa, Carnival, Princess, Aida, MSC, Seaborn, there are a number of cruise lines that use the names of their brand in the names of their ships. For example, Carnival Spirit, Sea Princess, or Seaborn Sojourn. Other lines have established words in the names of their ships to create the same sense of familiarity. Royal Caribbean ships all share the of the sea suffix. p and Australia share the Pacific prefix. While Cunard's fleet is currently all named for queens or queen consorts of the United Kingdom. Historically, and even today, shipping lines have named classes of ships in a certain way to help identify that class within the greater fleet of the shipping line or cruise line. A good example of this is in the 1930s, when p and introduced a new generation of passenger ship. These ships all shared the same Strath prefix to help identify them within the greater P&O fleet. These ships were the first to wear the iconic P&O colours of buff funnels and white hull, and included the Strath Neighbour, Strath Allen, Strath Eden, Strathmore and Strath Aird. Today we see a similar connection. For example, MSC Seaside class have so far all been named with C as the prefix, Seaside, Seaview and Seashore allowing them to stand out as a class of ships within the growing MSC fleet. So with so many different ways to name a ship and so many options available to cruise lines, why do we see shipping lines using the same name so often? Well, we can look at this in three ways. 
tradition, familiarity and public relations. Tradition forms a big part of the cruise experience. From the sail away party and the baked Alaska parades to the crossing of the line ceremony, many of the shipboard experiences we enjoy on modern cruise ships are steeped in tradition. The same can be said for the name of a ship. Some names are so important in the heritage of the cruise line that its inclusion in a new build helps to bring the sense of prestige and sentimentality that the original ship had with the passengers for that line. P&O's Arcadia is one example. The current Arcadia entered service in 2005 and carries the name of P&O's iconic 1950s built Arcadia. That Arcadia was beloved by travellers from the 1950s to the 1970s and helped establish P&O as a major player in the cruise market. The name is so significant to P&O that it has been used on two modern cruise ships, the 2005 and the 1997 ships of the same name. When Cunard's iconic Mauritania of 1907 retired in the 1930s, the line wasted little time in resurrecting the name, with a second Mauritania joining the fleet later that same decade. The list of other names that Cunard has reused is long, and includes Coronia, Saxonia, Franconia, Carmania, and Queen Elizabeth. Similarly, the White Star Line had reused names throughout its history as well. This includes the name Oceanic, which was used in two groundbreaking vessels, it was planned to be used on a third revolutionary ship that was never built. Other names include three Britannics, two Laurentics, and two Georgics. Utilizing these names over and over created a sense of familiarity for repeat guests, as well as building brand associations with the general public, which is likely why we've seen cruise lines adopt the same strategy in recent times. Holland America, for example, has a long tradition of having their flagship named Rotterdam. Perhaps the most famous example is the SS Rotterdam, which sailed with Holland America Line from 1959 until 1997. She was replaced in 97 by the 61,800 gross ton cruise ship Rotterdam, which sailed with Holland America until 2020 when she was sold to Fred Olsen Cruises. Holland America wasted little time before announcing that their new Pinnacle class cruise ship, which had already been named Rhindam, would take the name Rotterdam and become flagship of the fleet. Another benefit for cruise lines when they use a famous name from their past is the ability to generate public interest through public relations. We've seen this used in great effect recently with Carnival's new build Mardi Gras, the first in a new generation of cruise ships for Carnival. The ship takes the name from Carnival's first ever cruise ship. The shared name has allowed for some interesting comparisons between the 180,000 ton new build and its 27,000 ton namesake. Because the two ships share a name, it makes it easier to get the public talking about the new vessel by highlighting the features of the new ship and how far Carnival has advanced since it commenced services in 1972. Additionally, with Carnival set to celebrate its 50th anniversary in 2022, the line's next new build will be named Celebration. A nod not only to its namesake, but also in recognition of the celebration for the company's half century of services. With ships so often sharing names, it can be difficult to recognize which ship we're talking about when you're writing, when you're reading a book, or even watching a YouTube video. In some cases, a line will use a numeral suffix in the name of their ship to help identify it from its predecessor. This is the case when you look at Queen Mary and Queen Mary II. However, this is not standard practice. And in fact, even Cunard Line itself, which is famous for having Queen Mary II and Queen Elizabeth II, had never used a numeral suffix in the names of their ships prior to QE2's launch in 1967. That's why quite often you'll see the ship's names written with the year of the launch in brackets next to it to help identify those different ships, particularly useful for ships that don't have a numeral suffix after their name. As a side note, some names are never used again. Sometimes this is because the name is considered too strongly linked to one particular ship. P&O's beloved Canberra is a good example. When she retired in 1997, there were many rumours that subsequent new builds would be named Canberra, but many loyalists expressed concern about that name being linked to a modern cruise ship, and so far, the name Canberra has not been reused. Out of bounds names can also be associated with a terrible disaster, such as Titanic or Lusitania. HMHS Britannic, as many pointed out, did sink during World War I, However, the fact that she never officially entered White Star passenger service might go some way to explaining why White Star Line felt comfortable reusing the name on the MV Britannic a generation later. 
I hope you found the video interesting and if you enjoyed the video don't forget to give it a thumbs up and if you haven't already like and subscribe so you don't miss future videos. I'd like to send my thanks to Andrew Sassoli Walker, a Southampton based photographer who's given me access to his wonderful pictures of Canberra departing Southampton. My thanks also to Rob Henderson and Doug Kramer for access to the brilliant Henderson and Kramer collection. I've linked to both in the description below. If you're interested in further maritime history, check out my maritime history playlist. Or if you're more interested in what's going on in the cruising world at the moment, take a look at my cruise news playlist. Thanks once again for watching, and when it is safe for us to travel again, I hope to see you on board.